Thank you. Congratulations to you for lasting until the last talk of the day. Uh, there will be drinks after this, so let's get started. Let me introduce myself first. My name is Felipe Hoffa. I work at Google. I've been working at, for, at Google for six years this week, so happy anniversary to me. Thank you. Um, I started as a software engineer six years ago, and then four years ago I changed my role to be a developer advocate. A developer advocate is mainly a software engineer that speaks. <laughs> so now I travel the world, I go to conferences, I'm on videos, on social media, follow me on Twitter, etc., etc., etc. And I like sharing the technology that we have and the things that you can do. And today I'm going to talk about how to analyze GitHub, how to analyze billions of events, uh, terabytes of code. Uh, there's a lot of interesting things you can do with this. Um, any open source man maintainers here? Yes, you have your own project? That's awesome. Wh what kind of project? Uh, Cassandra Schema Migration. Cassandra Schema Migration. That sounds really cool. I'm going to find it maybe later. But if anyone has any question and wants to interrupt and wants to run any separate analysis, please raise your hand or just shout it and we can do any, everything interactively, even analyze your own projects or your favorite projects. Um, so when I show you this, what do you see here? GitHub, yeah, okay, what else do you see? Hmm? Code, yes. We understand code, what else? A license, yes. So yes, so, so there's a lot of things we can start finding here. At first it's code, but if we zoom in, we can find a license, we can find the modules that are being imported, things from the future, um, when was this file copyrighted, etc., etc., etc. And then if we start looking around, we also have the number of stars, the number of forks, um, how many people have contributed to this code, what kind of thing have they done, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So what we have here is uh, data, and it's in big letters because it's big data. There's a lot of data that we can analyze. Um, so who wants to analyze GitHub? Hopefully everyone here. Uh, but just to give some examples, project maintainers, if you have your own project, uh, you want to know how popular your project is. You want to measure your popularity compared to everything else. But it's not only about how popular it is, but who is following it, how they become, became aware of your project. Um, you want to manage change. If you want to offer a new API, if you want to change things, uh, you might want to know who are you helping or what are you breaking. Or if your project is healthy, um, are the issues close on time? Is the community participating, etc., etc., etc.? And we can measure those things. That's for a project maintainer. But then, also, if you are a project user, you want to know that kind of stuff, um, and you want to, uh, if you want to ask for new features, if you want to ask for changes, you want to add data to back whatever you are asking. And sometimes you're looking for related projects. We are going to look at that kind of thing too. And then, even more important, when you want to choose a project, if you want to choose one of the thousand JavaScript libraries that are lying around, uh, you may want to also ask these kind of questions. Is the project popular? Is the project healthy? Is the popularity growing? How is adoption going? What related projects I should be looking at, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And if you love data, uh, this is a perfect data set to come, explore, understand what's happening around, uh, compile this data for other people. You could, there's, a, there's a lot of startups that take this data and run their own analysis, rankings, etc. Uh, if you are a security researcher, if you want to see what things people are doing right or wrong, you can do this at large scale, investigate any language. And if you just love data, like me, um, you can go and play with this. We're going to look at three main data sets today uh, that all of you have access right now. 
One is the GitHub archive. This is a collection of all events on GitHub, all, all of the public events of GitHub for the last few years. So far, or the last time I counted, it was 8.7 billion events that updates every hour. Every hour we can see uh, everything that has been happening on GitHub, event by event, a star, a fork, a commit, etc. Um, and that's GitHub Archive. And recently I became aware and started using this other project, GHTorrent. GHTorrent allows you uh, takes basically the same data, but goes further and annotates it and adds more tables with more metadata so you can traverse the graph of metadata that each project, each user offers. And then uh, we also have a full copy of most files, open source files that are living GitHub so we can also analyze it. And I will show you how here. But let's go back in time how all of this got started. There was uh, another developer advocate back in 2012, Mr. Ilya Grigoric, that started downloading all of these events from GitHub. Um, he wanted, uh, GitHub was offering um, these events. He started collecting them, and then he wanted to uh, share what all this data that he had collected with the world. And to start off, what, how would anyone do this? Uh, you would leave these hourly files around. Um, the activity for each hour, it's pretty easy to get. It's just a gzip file. And one hour of data, compressed data, is approximately five megabytes. You can download that in less than a second. Uh, you can uncompress it. You can see that each hour has around 40 megabytes of real data when you uncompress it, uh, 18,000 lines, 18,000 events per hour. And that's pretty manageable until you want to analyze a full month, a full year, uh, seven years of data. Uh, if we multiply this file by uh, 365 days, 24 hours, and put everything together, now we're talking about 2.39 terabytes or 1.1 billion events. So when you want to, to share data that scale, uh, you have to look at a different way of doing things. And that was back in 2012 when we were also opening up uh, Be Google BigQuery. Who knows BigQuery here? Perfect. So this side knows BigQuery, this side doesn't. Uh, Hopefully, at the end of the, this talk, everyone knows how BigQuery works and how you can use it. So quickly, just to put everything on the same page, everyone on the same page, uh, BigQuery is a cloud analytical database. Uh, it's fast. It analyzes terabytes in seconds. It, you just need to know SQL to use it. It scales from bytes to petabytes. It doesn't matter how much data you have. You can just put it there, and you can analyze it. And it's always on. There's nothing to turn on. There are no server hours. There's no RAM. It's just BigQuery there where you can put your data and analyze it. Uh, you can integrate it with any other tool, tab Tableau, R, Python, wherever you want, Looker, etc. And something that is really nice is that you can share data. So you can put all of your private data here. But if you want to share it with someone else, you can. And everyone has a free monthly quota, a free terabyte, every month to query either your own data or what other people have shared with you. So what I'm going to do right now, uh, you can repeat it on your own computers. You just need to create an account with Google. You don't, with Google Cloud, you don't need a credit card. You will have access to all this data that is shared. So if you don't believe what I'm going to show you, you can do it on your own and just test it out and find, make, get your own findings. So to start with this, let's look at the stars, uh, GitHub stars. Uh, I'm sure you've seen rankings of popularity, which projects have more stars. Maybe you have star projects yourself. So. 
If we go to GitHub, to any project, let's say something with Cassandra, just yes, because that was the first example we got. And if I'm logged in, yes, I can start this project. Now Cassandra has one more star. And I can remove this star, and I can start it again, and I can remove, and pa 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 pa. And every time I start a project, this creates an event. And I have a table with all of this um, shared. This is BigQuery, the web UI. It also has a REST API, but the web UI helps a lot with to run things fast. So GitHub Archive, I have my days. I have 2,000 days of data. I also have the data by month from 2011 to 2017, May, June, etc. So if you want to see the number of stars, what are the projects that got the most stars? Let me switch microphones. If you want to see the projects that got the most stars, we just go to my, our table. This table has these columns, the type of event, if it's a public project, the payload, the repo ID, pop, 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 pop. So in May, we, this table is got 82 gigabytes of data, 33 million events. And I know that the stars are the ones that are type watch event. And I can get the repo name here. I can count the number of stars. And I can group by the first column, order by the second one in descending order. So what are the top 10 projects that got the most number of stars in May? Boom. So the first thing that you can notice here is that it analyzes one month of data really fast. Uh, 3.8 seconds to analyze 1.2 gigabytes. And the project that got the most stars was Free Code Camp, Face, followed by Facebook Prepack, uh, JetBrains Kotlin. It's pretty famous now that Android accepted it as one of its official languages. So it makes sense that this project got a lot of stars last month. Um, and you can continue looking at this. And now we are counting stars. Uh, I told you that to analyze all of this project was pretty fast. But let's say you want to analyze all of 2017, let's say all of 2016, just to make things more interesting. Um, if it took two seconds to do one month, how long will it take to do 12 months? Nine seconds, not bad. Now we process 11 gigabytes. And in all of 2016, these were the most interesting projects. And now we're counting. Now, uh, the first thing you have when you want to do this type of thing, you have to be aware of is if you come back here to see Apache, Cassandra, and the stars I gave it. Every time I do this, I'm create, generating a new event. So if people start counting stars like I just did, there's a lot of fake stars there. So we need to do things in a more interesting way. We need to count distinct actor ID. And now we are counting the number of stars, by, but only by the number of unique users. Uh, let's count. These are the real stars. And things start looking different in this case. So th these are things you have to be aware of when you are uh, analyzing a log of data. And still, things should work pretty fast if the query is capable of doing the deduplication fast. So yes, so FreeCodeCamp that had uh, received 185,000 stars last year really got 174,000. And some projects go up, down a lot, like this one got 2,000 less stars, et cetera, et cetera. This is just to get you started here. Any questions so far? Before we go deeper into the stars? OK. So th this, as we saw, these are the top projects, uh, deduplicating the stars. But things get more interesting when you start thinking that uh, not all stars are equal. 
is not only about how many stars everyone gets, because each star is given by someone. And whoever gives you a star has a different background. Uh, sometimes you might be getting stars by uh, newbies, people that are new to programming. Sometimes you are getting stars by people that have been programming for many years. Some, some people are experts in Java, some people are experts in big data. So if you, just, if you are just counting stars, you are losing a lot of additional data that might be interesting. You might, um, to give you an example here, uh, if last year Free Code Camp got 172,000 stars. And it got more stars than any other project, like it's an order of magnitude more. And then TensorFlow got 24,000 stars, and there were 3,000 people that start both projects. But then uh, I might want to see deeper things, like uh, let me see if I have my query here. I can start asking deeper questions like, so he, this is the, the query I have to compare any two projects. And in this case, I'm not only counting the number of stars, but the age of each user. How, I don't know the a user's age, but I know how long they've been around GitHub. Uh, how many repositories each one has watched. Uh, how many comments they have left. How many pull requests, pushes, etc., etc. I can start looking at all of these dimensions, and I can compare these projects not only by the number of stars, but uh, it turns out Free Code Camp, um, the age in GitHub, uh, how long they have been on GitHub, it's one year versus the people starting TensorFlow have been around for at least two in average. Uh, people that start TensorFlow have started 80 projects instead of 12, and they have left 2.4 comments in, in issues versus Zero point five for the other project, so you you can see that the nature of the stars is different. So the next question I wanted to ask here was, what are the top projects by stars from people that have experience in GitHub? So the question I ask here is, okay, what happens if I look for people that have left comments? So now if I look for the stars only by people that have left more than 20 comments on GitHub, uh, free code camp numbers go way down. We go down from 170,000 stars to only 3,000, which is much closer to the number of stars that TensorFlow got. And now it's your decision, depending on what you're looking for, if you want to see users that, do you care about users that are new to GitHub, or do you care about users with experience? In this case, it's pretty good for both. TensorFlow is a nice project for people with a lot of experience. And then FreeCodeCamp is a project for people that want to learn how to code. So if we compare the rankings, uh, the top star projects last year versus the top star last year only by people with a lot of experience, the top project changes. Uh, with four people with experience, the top project was Yarn, uh, followed by Google Interview University and Apollo 11, which goes a lot, uh, gets a lot of positions in the ranking. And TensorFlow, which we are very proud of, drops from the top 10 because they are projects that got more stars by people with experience. So the message here is always uh, look at more dimensions, look at what kind of data you care of. And now, if you, when a project has stars, let's say Cassandra or whatever other project, uh, you can start looking at, okay, people that start my project, where else did they start? So in this case, how are we doing on time? And in this case, with this query, I'm looking at, okay, I want to find people that start TensorFlow. And I want to see what other projects they start. And what's fascinating here is that it quickly gives me all of the other machine learning projects on GitHub. I get models from TensorFlow, I get Cafe, Keras, Google Interview University, Learn, Microsoft CFTK. 
So just by looking at related projects, but just by looking at related stars, I start getting a lot more dimensions and interesting things I could be looking at. And then, when people start looking at stars, uh, it turns out you don't get a lot, uh, the same number of stars every day. Uh, things fluctuate. Uh, one day your project has 100 stars, and the next day it has 2,000. And it basically, this happens because people get very interested about your project because they read it on Hacker News or any other uh, social website or there were news. So for example, I made this, um, this chart of the number of stars of, uh, in this case, three projects. And you can see that they get a lot of stars on one day or in three different days, but the, the rate is very sporadic. And the annotations, the little annotations that you can see there is every time the project was featured on the Hacker News front page. So basically, you get on the Hacker News front page, you will get a lot of attention and a lot of stars that day. Now, the most interesting thing for me here is that I didn't create these annotations manually, but I was able to do this with BigQuery. Because in BigQuery, I not only have all of these data, GitHub data sets, I also have all of the Hacker News comments. Uh, I have, I've stored a lot of red, uh, 3 billion Reddit comments too that you have access. So with a simple join like this, uh, it, this query basically looks at all of the Hacker News stories, which ones are pointing to a GitHub project. They, I'm then looking at the num what are the projects that got the most stars. And I can create a chart that shows me, yes, being on Hacker News and being on Hacker News these days gives you way more attention than you were expecting. And you, are you will be able to run this analysis cross sites, cross data sets. Let's talk a little bit about project health, the project with most issues, people feeling issues, et cetera, et cetera. Um, these were the projects that got the most issues, uh, comments on issues during 2016. On top, uh, Kubernetes with 17,000 issues, more issues than any other project, followed by Spark, followed by OpenShift, uh, followed by Sauron Demo. I don't know what that project is. Uh, you might know the other ones, but and this, again, is when you need to start looking, counting, not just doing a naive count, but looking at what's happening here. So. Um, uh, what, what happens with Sauron Demon is that it's a test project where one person is creating all of these comments, so I want to see things uh, go deeper. And with the query that I put here, I'm not only looking at the number of comments, I'm also looking at how many different people commented on each project. So this, instead of just looking at the number of comments, I'm, uh, I'm also more interested in having a large community with a lot of people commenting. And then I'm also doing, uh, I'm dividing those, the number of comments divided by the number of people, and that gives me the number of comments per author. Because as we can see in this ranking, Kubernetes had 500 authors where each one left about 18 comments. That's a pretty healthy community. This is a lot of people coming back and a lot of people writing, uh, uh, collaborating, while other projects that get a lot of comments too, like Font Awesome, uh, you just get less than two comments per person. This is just a lot of people coming, writing something, leaving, and not coming back. Um, and as Google, we are really proud to have uh, the top two projects in this ranking in community participation. So that shows you the communities are alive, the communities are working, and you, sh you can expect a lot from the top projects here. And just to make sure, in this query, I also removed um, everyone that is, looks like a robot, like people that left more than a 1,000 comments during a month. Those are removed, so my average is don't go up just because someone is writing, left a robot, leaving a lot of comments, so the average would go up. Um, we can even start doing text analysis. We can go beyond numbers. So for example, in this case, I'm looking at how people start an issue. What are the top ways to start an issue? How do you make a request on GitHub? 
So, and it turns out most people, the, the most uh, popular way to start an issue is, it would be nice, followed by, is it possible to, or I am trying to, and those are not only the most popular ways, things to do, uh, you can start looking deeper, and you can start looking at things like, is this working? Um, so in the third column there, I'm looking at how many issues got closed. And when you start an issue with, uh, it would be nice, you get 56% closure. And, but instead of writing, is it possible to? Gets you a way better percentage. We let's, it's a much better way to ask things. And the best way I have here to file an issue is to start with, I get the following. Being precise, I get the following, I'm expecting something else, just tell the project maintainers what you want and you will get closure. While things, the one that has the least closure is saying something like, so that the humans, which again is another test project that does that, but, and you would need to count the number of different user, uh, the number of different projects that are doing this. And this is a lot of people writing comments on the same project. Uh, that creates that glitch. But try to be very precise, try to define what you want and use the best language to get what you want. Um, this is also a very interesting thing. Uh, when people give stars, when people do things on GitHub, uh, many times you put in your profile, what's your own country? Where do you live? And that allows us to investigate how every country is different. So in this case, I'm taking the data shared by GS Torrent, the data set that looks at the metadata around GitHub. This is, so they are looking at every country that each people put, and I'm counting the number of countries, and of course, the United States is the top country there, followed by India, followed by China, followed by the UK, um, Deutschland, Alema uh, Germany, Brazil. So this is interesting and a, a little bit expected. Those are the larger countries on GitHub. But then you can start looking by activity, number of pushes, which it also gives you a similar number. But way more interesting is to look at divide by population. What are the top countries? Where do you get the biggest concentration of developers? So you can see that uh, the north of Europe has a lot more, is, uh, is, what is on top of the ranking of having um, coders by per capita. Uh, this is a query that I wrote. Let me see if I have the query here. Basically what I'm doing here is I'm with this query, oh, this is not standard SQL, I'm looking at push events, people that are pushing code, and I'm joining with this table of, that has all of the countries, uh, so, and has a population for each country, and with a simple join, I can see this Iceland had 159 users, which divided by population gives them the most, num the biggest number of coders per capita, followed by New Zealand, Sweden, Switzerland, Norway, etc. Let's see if we can find uh, Singapore. But I started doing these charts this morning, improving them, and I noticed that I didn't have New Zealand in my country's table, so I had to add it now. So you will see things that no one else has seen, at least by my, my queries. What we can see here is that, and if we look at this ranking, uh, is that the coldest countries are the ones that get the most developers per capita. So you might want to measure that. Where do coders go? Do you, they prefer cold places or hot places? What do you think? Colder, well, so that, that's what we just saw. Now, you, ha you happen to be coders and you happen to be in a very hot place, so let's try to quantify that. Uh, what, what if we got all of the weather for the world uh, in one place? And we have it, so I ran this query this morning this is, here I'm looking at the average temperature for each station 
uh, for each country in the world. So the size of the bar basically shows you uh, all of the variety of weather that each country has, and I'm sorting it by the average weather, and it turns out that Singapore is this one. It's a really hot place. Uh, there are places that get w hotter weather than Singapore, but in average, the three weather stations I have for Singapore show that this place is really, really hot, and you have no, not much variety of places to, to go. And then if I take this data, if I take the average weather for each country, so each country is pretty big, each country has a variety of weather, but still the average seems, uh, if I average all of their stations, at least it shows me something that makes sense. I can get a chart like this. Let me show you the query because there's nothing better than showing you real queries running. Uh, this is Redash. This is an open source project that is also really good to save your queries, visualize them, etc. Um, so what I did here, I, I got all of my stay, all of my weather for 2016, my stations. I'm looking for my countries, my countries. I'm grouping the average weather per per country, and I want only countries that have more than 10 stations. Or I did this manually, Singapore. Singapore has only three, but I still wanted to put this it on this chart. And I'm joining with, with my number of users per capita. And once I run this join for countries with a population of more than 300,000 people, I get this chart. And what you can see here, this is to the left, things are here, things are colder, things are hotter there. And you can see a line that shows you the average weather. Uh, for hotter weather, you get less developers. But what's also very interesting here is to see what are the outliers. So we have here Finland, Canada. These are the top countries in number of coders. And the less number of coders we have here is mm -hmm, Senegal, Niger. Uh, Mali, but then you have the outliers, places that are really cold, like Tajikistan, North Korea, Kazakhstan, Russia, and we have our outliers on the top. Like if you like hot places and you want to find a lot of programmers, you can go to Australia, you can go to Brazil here, and here on the right top right, the hottest place with a huge amount of developers per capita is Singapore. So yes, if you like hot weather and you want to find a lot of programmers, you are in the right place. The, the other interesting thing I found here is that if you color these things by continent, this is basically Europe uh, on top with the best uh, colder weather, and then you have Africa, so very hot with l less number of coders. And then if you look only at Asia, turns out you have the, an inverse relationship. Like the hotter things get, um, the more coders you, you get. Follow, Singapore is followed by the United Arab Emirates, which is also pretty hot and also has a huge concentration of coders. And in the middle you have South Korea and Japan. So, hopefully you can tell me more about this. If you know more, I love running this kind of analysis. Um, and then you can also find the top projects and what each country is starring, etc. But I want to show you, go to the other part of these talks where we look at the code, how we can analyze a lot of code with SQL. So the first thing we got here is that we announced last year that we were able to set up a pipeline that every week is copying all of GitHub's content, at least the open source code, into BigQuery. So you can go and analyze this. Uh, let me show you the real table. We have uh, our open data pro 
data sets here, BigQuery, public data, GitHub, repositories, contents. So in this table, today, we have 1.94 terabytes of code, 232 million files. The schema basically is the file with this ID has this size, these are its contents, and the number of copies. So in this table, what we did, instead of having duplicate files, which there are a lot of duplicate files on GitHub, uh, we store it each one only once, and then you can do a join with the um, files table to find out uh, what are the names, what are the extensions of each file. So to see exactly how much data we have, you can do a select the size of each file by the number of copies, and this tells us exactly how much data, how much code this represents. Oh, I want the sum. How much data do we have stored here? Pa -pa 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 -pam. This much data. So since bytes in terabytes, Google can compute faster than me. This is basically we have 49 terabytes of code that you can start analyzing at any time and doing interesting things with it, like um, okay, things you have to remember when you are analyzing this data set before doing the demos. Uh, you will find only the contents for text files, because it wouldn't make sense to copy binary files. Uh, each file, we have one unique copy, as I showed you. You can join it with the repository, with the files table to see all the path. But try not to do a join to just to get everything, because you will end up with 49 terabytes of code, and that's not what you want. You want to analyze. You don't want 49 terabytes of code like there. Um, so if you are going to run an analysis, uh, the first thing you should do is just extract from this table all of the files you want. Uh, extract all of the Java files, extract all of the PHP files. Uh, I left you some of these tables. But start by extracting and then running the analysis you want. Uh, for example, there is a table with 10% uh, of contents of the top projects with one sample password file. Uh, to get you started so you don't run out of the f one free terabyte you have every month. Uh, it's only open source projects. You, if you want your project to be here, make sure it has a license that GitHub knows that it's open source. And some projects are missing because GitHub cannot tell that uh, the license is one of the approved licenses. So things that we've done with this, I've done, uh, for example, if you want to analyze Java, if you, uh, in what I did here is with this query, I'm just looking at every line of code written in Java. So I extracted all of the code from Java from 2013. I can split each line. Now I'm analyzing uh, code itself. And then for each line, I'm only keeping the lines that start with import. And now I'm counting the number and getting the percentage of files that start with this import. The percentage of imports that start like this. And what I can see here is not only what were the top imports for each year, I can see what were the top growth what has, be, between 2013 and 2016, turns out the project that most, the import that most had the most growth in representation was injection. And the Google Common immutable lists. And some of other classes, nullable. So you can see how the language evolves. I have 15 minutes left, so we are doing well. Um, also, if you can analyze code, you can extract, for example, all of the URLs that are pointing to Stack Overflow. And we also have Stack Overflow on BigQuery. So that means that you can see what are the top questions people are pointing to. Uh, with these queries, I'm doing a regular expression extract. 
of anything that points to Stack Overflow questions from, in this case, all of the JavaScript files. And that shows me, OK, these are the top questions that people are linking from GitHub code to Stack Overflow, and what's the question. And when we're talking about JavaScript, the top uh, question asked is, what is the, if there is a regular expression escape function in JavaScript, how to encode the code base64, uh, you want to detect number as a decimal, x decimal to JavaScript, pa, 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 pa. So for any language, you can go and see, OK, this is what people are copying. And the project that Sebastian Baltes released two weeks ago is he was uh, curious about how many people go to Stack Overflow, uh, look at the problem they have, copy the code into their base, uh, because that's basically what we are all doing when we work. But yes. But that has some legal problems because uh, this code has special uh, uh, specific license. You need to license your code that, uh, in a certain way. So it's not good. But we can measure how people are doing it. So for example, he went, found one of the most popular Java questions, which is how to convert by size into human readable format in Java. Someone asked this in 2010. The answer from 2010 has almost a thousand upvotes. Uh, it's a pretty beautiful answer too to translate numbers to human readable format. And the question is, how many people have copied this answer and put it on their own code? So the first thing he did was he took the answer, and he tried to create a regular expression that looks like that answer, which looks complicated, uh, but it's basically the structure of the answer that could fit in any format that people ended up putting it. And yes, uh, with this query, that with this regular expression, he found this answer in 448 different Java files. And only 27% of these files at least gave credit to Stack Overflow. And all of the matches with the regular expression look like the copy of Stack Overflow, so that's an alarm for anyone that is just copying code from Stack Overflow. People can find out. Um, this is some cool stuff from the Go world, like when you're asking for things like uh, Sam came and wanted a better way to express uh, time until. He wanted to have a time until. Instead of writing after time until, he wanted to do uh, the goal language to offer these facilities. Just to make code most theirs. And my teammate, Francesc, uh, brought data to this feature request. So Francesc took, wrote this query, and he found out there are 2,000 repositories on GitHub that can benefit from this feature. So this is pretty cool, because if you want to ask for something new from the Go language, you can tell them, this is how many projects would benefit. And even if you don't ask for anything, just by open sourcing your code and leaving it on GitHub, um, your code is voting for, new, for the development of the language. Because people can analyze your code, and people can see, oh, the, you would benefit uh, since this time uh, now uh, uh, for a couple of months uh, Go now offers this new API. Uh, same as someone else came asking to have to fix TLS config because it used one spelling in one package and a different spelling on another different Go package and it seems like a good idea to be consistent but then Frances ran a different query and he found out that if they, go, if they fix that, there will be at least 685 repositories that break. And so far, they have not chosen to fix this because they don't want to break these repositories. So yes, your, vote, your code counts as votes when you let other people analyze it. We can go beyond regular expressions. Um, regular expressions are cool, but they have a limit, anyone that writes has written a regular expression and you want something more complicated, uh, you know the limits of it. So you can 
go deeper. Uh, in BigQuery, you can do more than SQL code. Inside your SQL queries, you can write JavaScript code. And with that, you are free to do a lot more stuff. In this case, I took a GitHub project that is called J JS Hint that does static code analysis. So with a query like this, uh, basically I'm telling the query to read the JavaScript code that I downloaded from the internet, take JS Hint, run this query, look at all my JavaScript files that are between this size and this size, and in the middle of my query, I'm able to add this JavaScript code, which calls JS Hint, reads the code, uh, creates some that's a static code analysis, and I collect all of the warnings. And now I'm able to analyze anything I really want to analyze. I just want, need to write a parser that analyzes code with all the freedom in the world. And yes, I found results that um, the most uh, frequent warning that JSHint gives is missing semicolons, or but then you also have warnings that look at variables without that are capable of detecting that something is a variable, but now the name doesn't matter. It just knows because it's able to analyze code in real time. And my last, the last demo I have here is pretty popular question, is spaces or tabs? Who is for spaces? Who is for tabs? Who likes Go? Oh, we don't have Go, yes. Well, so what I did here, again, uh, I love showing you queries. First, I define my rules. How I'm going to measure space versus tabs. First, I'm going to look at everything I have in the query, but not all of the repositories will count in my ranking. I want to look only at the top 400,000 repositories, and I choose the top 400,000 repositories by the number of stars. I need to see stars. Uh, those are the projects that which, which votes I will be counting here. I'm looking for files that have more than 10 lines, only one vote per unique file. If a file has spaces and tabs, I will count and see if it has more spaces than tabs and give the vote from that file uh, based on that. And I will only look at these top languages. First step, extract. From my sample code, I will only get the files with these extensions, and then I can write a query like this. Let me switch microphones. So, my query here, let's run it while I talk, looks at these exact rules. I'm looking at if it has tabs or spaces. I'm sp doing the split but to look at each line, uh, looking at lines that start with spaces or tab that at least have 10 of these lines. And uh, these were my results, which look better visualized. And I can copy this data quickly to um, a spreadsheet. And just because it looks more beautiful, I want, I'm going to do a copy of my table here. So, what I want to do is look at tabs in a negative space. So basically, I'm going to do the opposite B2. Yes, everyone is pretty curious about what are the results. So these are my results. I will do a chart, insert, a chart. Let's make this more beautiful. Tab versus spaces, stacking, standard. And here you have the results. As you can see, in Java, everyone prefers, most people prefer spaces, but this is not by only by language. Uh, every language has different preferences. In C, is 50-50. And languages like Go, if you are a Go fan, everyone is doing 
tabs. That's the language you should go to if you are a tabs fan. While in Ruby, everyone does spaces for one reason that I don't know. Oh, yes, uh, this is how fast you can run any analysis you want over a lot of code. And it's also pretty, to, pretty easy to add visualizations and write, uh, go, get these results. So yeah, there's a lot more. I, I think we, yes, I only have nine minutes left. I want to leave some time for questions. Uh, I really like what some Googlers did here. There was a big, big, big security bug found last year. And these Googlers found out that there were a lot of unprotected projects. And 50 Google employees uh, went out to fix all of them. So they started by using this code base to find every place that was, was open to this bug. And they fixed all of them. And that was really cool. So yes, uh, even GitHub uses BigQuery to analyze themselves. I made this video with Alison, one of their data scientists. Check that video if you want to see more of how they do it. Um, I hope everyone wants to analyze GitHub. There's a lot more that people have published. I'm collecting everything I find with this data set. So uh, you can go deeper with this. You can also ask Guillaume what he has done with Groovy, because as a Groovy maintainer, owner, uh, he's really interested in that, etc. And if you have more questions, find me on Reddit, find me on Twitter. Uh, Stack Overflow is a great place to ask questions. If you have feedback for me, I love feedback. Um, we can go drink now, unless you have questions before we end this. Thank you. <laughs> Let me take a picture of you. You are the brave, one, brave ones that stayed until the end. Any question? Do we have access to those data sets not from GitHub, but in the Google data if we want to? If you want, if you want to do this, yes. Uh, we could, you could do this immediately from your own notebook. If you create a Google account, uh, you go to Cloud, uh, BigQuery Cloud Google Com, you create an account, you can run any of these queries right now. So yes, all of this is open, shared, and ready to be queried. You, you don't need to start by downloading a terabyte of data. No, the data is there, be queries on, you can copy paste any query or write your own, it will be working. Yes. That's an excellent question. How is it possible that we were able to do things this quickly? Uh, one, BigQuery is magic. Uh, no, it, it, it really is. Like, that's the, what a lot of people say. I, 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 I've been saving Twitter comments because it really changes how people are working. Like, we have customers like Spotify that know a lot about big data, but one day they start using BigQuery, and it's like, whoa, their problems are gone because they have to, they can forget about all the maintenance, like they can just load their data, and it's working. Um, maybe I can load a diagram of how BigQuery works, but just to, the, the secret here, uh, the secret of BigQuery are two. One is decouple uh, storage from computing. So everything that you store on BigQuery it doesn't live in servers, because what you need to do in every big data system, what people do for performance is they put the data on each computer. So in most big data systems that you might be using, the first question is, when you load data, is how do you want to distribute data? How many servers you want? How do you distribute it between servers? Uh, because that's the only way to get fast results. Because if you put the data in a different place uh, across the network, networks are slow, 
So analyzing data arbitrarily and not distributing it will be slow, unless you have a very, 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 very insanely fast network. And that's what we have inside the Google data centers, a one petabit bisectional network. So we don't need to think about data locality anymore. Um, data can live in a separate place, so, and that allows us to not think about distribution. We just put it there, and we're able to read it in parallel. The other secret of the query is the ability to just have a thousand servers um, analyzing things. So if I come to my query analyzing here, we can see the explanation. The first step in this query, like just yes, counting spaces versus tab, took 13 million files, which were the beginning of this, and uh, the output was just 7,000 rows. Basically, you could think that there were around 7,000 servers, nodes, the slots as we call them, um, reading this data in parallel. And if you have a lot of computers being able to run in parallel, uh, that means that your performance can be almost linear. You have more data, we have more slots, more computers reading it in parallel. And then the next stages just need to analyze uh, the data that these are leaving. But basically you have access to a lot of computers in real time, and you're only paying for queries. You're not paying for the thousand servers, you're only paying for how much data your queries can. Mm -hmm. Yeah, is this servers? Is this physical servers or containers? These are containers. So we really call them slots. That's the, and yeah, this doesn't mean that there were 7,000 servers. It means that there were 7,000 rows of output. But sometimes, uh, l let me run a simpler query that just counts things. So let me, Look at Reddit comments. In September 2016, and I want to. What I want to do here is with standard SQL. So BigQuery used to have its own SQL, but now we can do it on standard, which a lot of people prefer. And I want to count the distinct number of users. Uh, the authors. So uh, count this thing usually is uh, an expensive operation to run. And what I'm doing here is getting it pretty fast. I'm getting that there were three million different users on Reddit in September last year. And the explanation shows me that I went from 67, 67 million rows to 52 million. And then this, there was a shuffle here to be able to run the, to be able to count in parallel. So each server that was counting in the next layer uh, was sure that there was no other server counting like this. Well, one question, sorry, hmm? from the yes. Yes. Yes, we have a magic shuffle system. It's <laughs> no, no. I, I mean, th things are you sell it fast. Like a lot of people ask me, "Hey, can I run BigQuery in my own data center?" Uh, the answer is no, because things here go beyond software. This is really making the most out of our custom hardware and networking that is able to run shuffling at any same speed. Yes, it, in a normal database, a cross join kills your database. Uh, in this case, uh, I can run pretty insane shuffles, like what I just did here. And here we have a better look at how many servers were involved. 
50, at least on the after the shuffle. There were 50 different counts, and what stage three does is it just adds the, num the unique number that each server gave. And then if I want to just do all of 2016 instead of only one month, I can add a star, and things again are insane because it's fast. <laughs> and now instead of 50, we had 300 servers, nodes, uh, slots involved. Yeah. Yes, please. Yeah, uh, the 7,000 servers was a little bit of an exaggeration because each one of the slots involved uh, gave more than one row. And what we are counting here is rows. But, so that's why I ran this different query where I'm sure that each node only outputs one row after the shuffle. So these 577, uh, 500 million, half a billion rows, uh, just were counted by 320 different slots. Yes, so where is the data? Uh, the first step when you're running for to run all of these queries is to load the data in BigQuery. So, BigQuery is able to read data from external systems. If you leave it on Google Cloud Storage, if it's on Bigtable, uh, BigQuery can even read data from spreadsheets, from Google Spreadsheets, if you want to do joins with data that some analysts is doing. And, but what you really, really want with BigQuery is to load your data. So when you do something like this. You, if you're using the web UI, you basically tell it, this is my file that I will upload. Don't upload a terabyte file, put it on cloud storage first. And you only need to tell BigQuery, this is the table where I want to leave things. And this is my schema. And it can automatically detect the schema. This BigQuery will take your huge file and store it in a columnar storage format, uh, optimizing, as more, optimizing it to be analyzed later. But the number of decisions you need to make is almost zero. You basically tell it, this is my file, and these are my columns that can be auto-detected, and that's it. BigQuery can do the rest of the optimization itself. Yes, yeah, so the first step would be having your data in a CSV or a JSON file and telling BigQuery, this is my CSV, this is my JSON. Yeah. Yeah, so if you want to do use it for reporting, uh, a great place to store all of your data is inside BigQuery. Because it will be... Uh, so you don't have access to the uh, background storage. After it's stored in BigQuery, you uh, use the BigQuery API to access it. Just, just for the knowledge. Huh? We don't want to access the storage, just for the knowledge. Where does it actually store? Is it uh, GFS or is it somewhere else? Oh, uh, so the question is if we're using Bigtable or Spanner or... I'm trying to think what is our latest official answer, but it's one of... Uh, we could say it's big table. Like a lot of Google is based on big table, and if it's not a big table, it's in Spanner. But yeah, it's one of our two main storages. <laughs> yes. More questions? I will be drinking with everyone else. If not, find me there. Send me questions. Find me on Reddit. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh -huh.